Good morning. Hey, Pam. How's it going? Uh, fine. It, I know it's morning here, so it's probably not morning there, right? No, it's actually uh, 1 p.m. Okay. But first and foremost, thank you so much for jumping on. It's a pleasure. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm always ready to help. It's it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, I've been spending so many years uh, with American Staffordshire Terrier and the American Pitbull Terrier. And so I've kind of like uh, gotten into the French Bulldogs. And so that's where my goals and my focus has been. And now I've got people and not just yourself but others that are kind of allowing me to resurface and uh <laughs> and have some very fond memories of course so i just retired uh in well, april news. of 2020 i just retired in april of 2020 especially when the pandemic hit and so it's allowed me to have a lot more time and start, you know, ramping up some new goals. I'm a very goal-driven person. <laughs> well, I can uh, I can imagine based on the conversations we've had and how many achievements you have under your belt. Um, let's go back. Uh, tell me your story, like um, beginning with um, your first pit bull terriers. Okay. Well, I was living in, um, out of Reno, Nevada, in a little town called Susanville, California. Mm -hmm. And um, I had met a fella that had a American Pitbull Terrier. And he wanted me to start showing the American Pitbull Terrier. And I thought that was a good idea. And there was a lady in Reno, Nevada, who's very well known in United Kennel Club uh, show ring. And she also sponsored many shows in Reno, Nevada. It was called the Silver State American Pitbull Terrier Club. And I went to her um, and she was sort of a mentor. And I said, well, if I was to buy an American Pitbull Terrier, to get started with the show type instead of just, you know, I had a pet with the boyfriend. We just had a pet. And so I studied the standard. To me, that's the most important thing that everybody needs to know and needs to do is to study the standard and look at it more than once. Go back to it uh, several times. I also looked at several pictures of dogs, um, in the Bloodlines magazines, which was a magazine that was put out by United Kennel Club. And so I would go and look at pictures and I would study. Um, it, was a, it was very important to me to associate the standard with uh, pictures that I was seeing in, in these magazines. But the, the lady in Reno, Nevada was Janice Snyder. And uh, I still have some contact with her once in a while um, on social media and she's a wonderful lady and she really helped me out by sending me in the right direction which of course I went right to the very best which was Dick and Nancy Jones of Tough Town Kennels and Dick and Nancy Jones were breeders and they were very strict breeders and they had a great agenda, and they also believed in health testing, especially hips um, at that time for good hips on the American Pitbull Terrier breed. And Dick and Nancy Jones had a library full of books, and they had used a uh, dog called... Um, Let's see, I'm trying to think of his name. He was a big old pretty chocolate dog. And they had used him on a female 
And so they, I got a hold of them, and they recommended me to go to Phil and Ann Lyons of our gang kennel to get a puppy that was out of their champion show dog. And so that's kind of where I got started, and then I developed a, you know, relationship with Dick and Nancy Jones, and I flew to Los Angeles several times. And I literally camped out with them and uh, looked at the Bloodlines magazines that they had. And Dick and Nancy Jones were perfect mentors. And, um, you know, I appreciate everything I learned from them. They were wonderful people. And I I felt like I was bugging them a lot (laughs) because I always ask a lot of questions. And they took me underneath their wing, and um, I progressed from there. And it was a wonderful journey with them. So when and why did you transition over to the American Staffordshire Terrier? Well, um, I showed my first American Pitbull Terrier to his grand championship that I had um, uh, purchased through Dick and Nancy Jones, not directly from them, but out of their stud dog. And um, I took and purchased a dog from them, which was uh, basically another tough town dog. And so I bred the two together. It was like a grandfather, granddaughter breeding. And that's one thing that I did learn from Dick and Nancy Jones is that one of the, if you want to set type, you, you have to line breed and, uh, and, there is a big difference between line breeding and inbreeding, but you definitely need to know what you're doing if you ever do an inbreeding. Um, and unless you have two perfect subjects, I would I usually don't recommend inbreeding. Mm-hmm. Um, but the line breeding is perfect grandfather to granddaughter was my most successful combination throughout the years with the American Pit Bull Terrier and also with the American Staffordshire Terrier. Mm-hmm. And it was about 19... 19- 90, I think that I purchased my first American Staffordshire Terrier. And the reason why is I had fulfilled a lot of my goals in the UKC ring. And I enjoyed UKC. It wasn't as structured uh, or as intense as the uh, uh, AKC ring. And so at one point I decided to go over to AKC and have an AM staff as long as I could develop an AM staff that had the looks of my American Pitbull Terrier. Back then, the American Pitbull Terrier was more of a substantial dog, and of course this is my opinion, uh, than the American Staffordshire Terrier. The American Staffordshire Terriers were just a little bit too narrow and and small for my likings until I came across uh, Percy uh, champion Sierra Percy Penny Packer. And then once I saw this dog, then I thought that's where I'll start and I will get the look uh, to the American Staffordshire Terrier that I want to see that I feel was from the interpretation that I got from the AKC standard of the American Staffordshire Terrier. One thing that you used to read, and I haven't looked at the standard lately on the American Pitbull Terrier, one of the things you used to read is they were supposed to have a brick head and uh, good bone, round bone, good large bone, you know, not over bone, but there's supposed to be bone there in their front legs. Mm-hmm. And this has always been on my mind that this is what I want to see according to the standard brick head and, and large front bone. And, if you, uh, and it stayed with me all of my life through both breeds, and I still look for that today. Sometimes I don't see that, but, uh, you know, I've gotten away from breeding, and uh, it's, it's 
<laughs> it was a wonderful journey, like I said, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the AKC ring not only because I felt that I could uh, breed a dog that I felt was substantial to the standard and to learn a little more tricks of the trade, per se, in handling dogs because it's really important if you show dogs that you need to do it very properly. You need all the pre-training, and of course that was me. I didn't want to ever go into the ring with a dog that was substandard. I, I didn't want to go into the ring without doing it in the most professional way that I possibly could. And I picked up a lot of wonderful points, uh, pointers from AKC handlers, uh, even I had gotten into bull mastiffs, and the most important thing to me was to maybe hire um, a handler, an AKC professional handler, and so I could learn more from them because I could take what I learned in the AKC as far as ringmanship, and I could go and apply it into the UKC, and it was even better there because um, some people showing in the UKC, you know, just didn't transfer over to the AKC like I did. Mm -hmm. And so they, they showed their dogs their way. But I wanted to show my dogs in the best form possible because it only helps you um, as a breeder to be able to present your dogs properly, groom them properly, and feed them properly. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Now, <laughs> in your opinion, what do you think the main differences are between – the UKC standard for the American Pit Bull Terrier and the ADBA standard for the American Pit Bull Terrier. I mean, I think there's pretty obvious differences, but I, I want to hear it from you. Yeah. Well, um, the ADBA standard, they um, kind of uh, breed toward more of a racier look. Um, they want to seem to keep up the tradition of the the kind of the fighting dog look mm -hmm. i mean not that all anybody does that anymore but um you know but we have to keep one thing in mind that that's what the american pit bull terrier was bred to do mm -hmm. uh, at one point and uh but they you know they they fixed up the standard a little uh tighter in the uh UKC for the American Pit Bull Terrier and they kind of just you know they want more of the racier look um you know and there's people out there that have some some good looking dogs uh that are in the ADBA uh they have a tendency to allow them to display a little more of a gamey temperament in that arena. And that is something that I didn't ever want to do because breeding good natured and good temperament consistently on the American Pit Bull Terrier was my big goal just so I could introduce, you know, to my friends and my family and the world that these dogs could be gentle mm -hmm. and not bite because, you know, the reputation that follows the American Pit Bull Terrier uh, has, has been terrible. And, uh, but I think responsible breeding has really helped. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Now, do you yeah. think? Uh, do you think there's? Um, I guess I don't know where on the timeline I'm thinking, but do you think there's a real difference between the UKC American Pit Bull Terrier and the AKC Amstaff? Ah. Uh... 
You know, and once again, this is going to be my opinion after doing um, lengthy study clear back behind the American Staffordshire Terrier way back into some pedigrees that actually were American Pit Bull Terriers behind the Amstaff way back, such as the Tacoma Dogs. But do I feel that there's a difference personally between the temperament and the body structure? No, I do not. Mm-hmm. I, I do not, after having both Amstaff and American Pit Bull Terriers, but, you know, like I said, I, I tried to breed them all alike anyway, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. But the, uh, the big thing is, is UKC, the American Pit Bull Terrier, was around, you know, a, a long time before the Amer- American Staffordshire Terrier. And the American Staffordshire Terrier, um, it, it, was, uh, it was a group of of people from the AKC that wanted to implement the American Pit Bull Terrier into the AKC uh, database. and But the American Pit Bull Terrier breeders that were willing to to change the name and it didn't start out as the American Staffordshire Terrier um, I think it was Staffordshire Terrier or Yankee Terrier you know there was a couple of names that that AKC wanted to use instead of American Pitbull they wanted the word pit out of um, the name Mm-hmm. And so they they uh, set up a standard with AKC. Um, uh, one big thing in the standard for the new American Staffordshire Terrier way back in the early 1930s was um, not to have over 80% white. And the reason being, as what I was told, is they didn't want over 80% white on this American Staffordshire Terrier because they didn't want people to be confusing the new American Staffordshire Terrier with the Staffordshire Bull Terrier. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And so, so people... There were a few breeders that obliged and uh, did uh, allow their dogs to be the first registered dogs into AKC as the American Staffordshire Terrier. And yes, these were people that um, were old, old time American Pit Bull Terrier breeders. But there was a lot of them not willing to change the name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. How did you come up with the name Gaff Kennels? <laughs> well, uh, I in nineteen uh, let's see, uh, ni- it's actually nineteen eighty eight or eighty nine. Nineteen eighty nine. I married a fella uh, named Richard Gaffney. and he was working for Foster Farms. Uh, yeah, he was a dead haul, uh, hauler, and everybody called him Gaff. And I thought, well, you know, um, when I was with the American Pit Bull Terrier, I really didn't have uh, much of a kennel name uh, to, to start, but later on I did come up with Gaff, and I liked it because it was easy to spell and uh, easy to remember. And it was short. It was not a big, long word. And I did want something that was easy to remember. And then, of course, uh, you know, if you look up the word gaff, you know, gaff is to hook, you know, reach out, you know, the gaff of it. I kind of liked the way everything (laughs) worked out with that name. It just kind of fell together for you. Yeah, That's yeah, cool. it it did, and I've stuck with it for years. And uh, I used to even have the same phone number for years and years when I was, you know, back back then breeding the dogs. 
Right, okay. Who would you say your favorite American Pitbull Terrier of all time, as well as who was your favorite Amstaff of all time? I would say there's there's actually two dogs. Um, there's a lot of fond memories with the first American Pit Bull Terrier that I got from Dick and Nancy Jones' friend, Ann Lyons. And his name was Our Gang Seiko. And Seiko was a beautiful chocolate-colored solid male, and I had a lot of fun with him. And I think that he kind of put me on the map. And then as time went on, um, I his grandson, which was Gaff's California Top Gun, both of them were grand champions. Seiko, I finished Seiko to his grand championship, and then um, I... I, and, I, and once again, you know, I just did line breedings uh, throughout most of my early American Pit Bull Terrier um, breeding program to set type. And then, you know, once you set type, which is there's the standard, this is what I feel is the standard according to the way I read it. And once you uh, do that, then you um, can go out once in a while because you don't, or to another dog, uh, obviously one that you feel, you know, is the standard also. And that's that's kind of the way I did my program is, is line breeding. And then when I felt that I was breeding within the line too much, which can happen to anybody, you know, uh, then you need to go out and then you can come back in to your line. Mm -hmm. But you had to find the right out also. So that's kind of what happened with that. As far as the American Staffordshire Terrier, of course, Percy was my very favorite that I did not breed. Um, but I had some females that were outstanding and that could go in the ring and win over top males in the AKC. And I think that that's where it's at. I think if you can get uh, great best of breed wins and do it with a female uh that is really a double plus and my favorite was uh gaff's piece of the pie she was a champion and the other one was uh gaff's champion gaff's uh california zima and she also won best of opposite sex at the akc nationals and she was a actually in the terrier group, which is really, really hard back in the day. It's not as bad now. That's one big change I've seen in the AKC lately. <clears throat> is it seems to be easier now to get a group placement in the terrier group with an AM staff than it was back when I was showing AM staff. Mm -hmm. um, but I did get a couple of them and then of course there was a couple of dogs that i had bred that was winning some group placements but just recently in the last decade which would be say from 2010 on there is more american staffordshire terriers that are doing group placements than ever mm -hmm. Okay. And that's a, that's a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um I've mm -hmm. never actually uh I've never actually participated in a dog show myself, but I've watched countless videos and um mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to be uh quite a challenge across the board. I mean, people put so much time into these dogs. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. And like I said, not you know the pre-training uh before you go into the ring. I mean, you have to start these these out as puppies. Uh I I'll, I'll be setting up little puppies on my kitchen table on a towel at 4 weeks of age. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm and and compare and compare and it was a lot of fun because I love to look at dogs. I like to look at all kinds of dogs, mm -hmm. you know, all breeds. And uh, and there's nothing like 
you know, a great representation of that particular breed. So, and, and I find that really uh, substantial in the AKC. Um, you know, and I used to sit ringside uh, when they did groups and I would hang out for best in show because I was so hungry to learn as much as I could because because showing was my big objective for breeding the dogs in the first place. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. When Okay. When you would basically stack puppies like on the table like that, um, that kind of leads me into another question. When, when a dog is young like that, can you see like right away if everything's going to come out correct or um, is it kind of a chance when they're so young or how do you select a puppy that you know will succeed? Well, obviously you can't really tell a whole bunch as far as movement goes, uh, but you can see confirmation. And yes, um, I compare under jaw to under jaw. I look at the under jaws of puppies. Um, I want to look, uh, I put puppies uh, side by side as far as nose to nose, and I'll pull them out in front of me. And so that way I can just physically look at the length of the muzzle, the depth of the mus muzzle as one compared to the other, and which one I feel would do better in the show ring. And, you know, and then, um, but I was never, but I mean, it's nice to have a good moving dog. However, um, some people could lose type by creating nothing but movement or wanting nothing but movement. And first off, the American Pitbull Terrier is really seriously not a movement dog, a moving dog. They should be able to do an up and a back and a nice circle with some reach and some drive uh, to test soundness. And this is coming straight from my mentors, too. Mm -hmm. that the breed should be sound, but they are not supposed to move around the ring like a poodle. You see what I mean on that? Mm -hmm. This is a sturdy dog. And remember, you know, that this, this, these roots go back to the fighting dog. And the fighting dog was not a moving dog. But they they should display muscularity and, um, and depth and uh nice hawks and uh but i uh, i could tell a lot from confirmation on a young puppy i used to pick them wet is that was my favorite and i always kept the best female always mm. um to me males were a dime a dozen it's nice to have a great male but females that's what goes to the whelping box. Right. Okay. Now, what program, if any, outside of yourself, um, do you really admire as of like today? Um, as far as a breeder goes? Yeah, as far as a good uh, pit bull or am staff breeder. Um, uh -huh. If somebody was looking for a good or even a great dog, who would you recommend today? Um, well, one, one person that is uh, changing his program, uh, as we speak and is taking it kind of back to the older style look, because there is a different style. There is a different look in the AKC ring today, as opposed when I was showing dogs, because once again, I, I, always had a little more than a terrier type look mm -hmm. and uh and they won and and but today i would be really surprised if i took like um gaps limited edition which was a big boy uh very substantial bone and beautiful beautiful headpiece uh with a shorter muzzle um 
and he was well loved by everybody. But if I took Eddie back into the ring today, I would really even question whether or not he would win in today's AKC Amstaff ring because he just was the what we call old school. And but there is one fella that has. Um, kind of uh, or redoing or overhauling his program and he is going back and he is breeding to uh, like Percy uh, 26 year old semen and he's got some puppies that I really like uh, and remind me of my puppies when I was breeding way back when um, it's um, uh, his name is Justin McGrew and he's one person that is out there right now um, bringing it back, as we say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it's hard for me to come up with too many others because I have been away from the Amstaff uh, circle, I should say, uh, because I'm doing more into the French Bulldogs. And it would be hard to say who else is out there breeding uh, with with as much passion as Justin is doing right now. <laughs> and I hope he continues it. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Now, as far as health goes, has there any has there ever been any health issues you've ran into with either the Pitbull or the Amstaff? Um, the American Pitbull Terrier, no. Um, I I can't think of any issues there at all. The American Staffordshire Terrier, yes, a little bit in the beginning, and I'll and I'll be real honest with you on this. If you are breeding American Staffordshire Terriers, you absolutely must do one health test, um, and it's the ataxia, mm-hmm. the ataxia testing. And the and, and and when I first had American Staffordshire Terriers and started breeding them, the ataxia thing was very unknown. And there was not a test out for it in the beginning of breeding the American Staffordshire Terrier uh, for me. Mm-hmm. And then it has something that has come about, <clears throat> I would say, I, I would say within the last, it's just been within the last maybe 15, maybe 20 years at the most that everybody has started uh, ataxia testing the American Staffordshire Terrier. And it's it's a type of a, a, a uh, in the brain, it has a type of uh, malfunction in the brain, and it only usually occurs on older Amstaffs. The reason, the reason, um, some people say that they may have some this problem because the Amstaff ring is is uh, the breeding program is all the same. It's it's a tighter program because AKC will not will not uh, or has not opened up the books. Uh, to la- allow in something new, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. There, some people had thought that the UKC American Pitbull Terrier, you know, sh- could possibly be registered with AKC, but they didn't. They didn't want that. They didn't want any part of that. So it's a tight circle with the Amstaff breed. And now this is just some things that I have heard. But nobody really knows for sure. Right. I gotcha. Yeah. So yeah. we've touched on this before, um, but I wanted to get it again for the listeners. As far as coat color is concerned, um, there's a lot of question around um, the blue dogs and whether or not um, pit bulls should even be blue in the first place. Where do you think that comes from? Well, I really don't know. Um, The American Pitbull Terrier, as far as being blue, 
Um, I don't have a problem with that. And I don't, you know, they have the red noses, and that's like a recessive gene, and so is the the blue. And um, as far as the coat color, I think that it's it's a pretty coat color. And but I think that if you breed too much blue, then you're going to start fading out that color, and it's going to get a lighter nose and lighter eyes which I have always been a person for strong pigment uh, on any breed. Mm -hmm. So as far as the Amstaff goes, um, they there's not as many blues in the AKC because they don't want blue. Some people don't want the blue. AKC, American Staffordshire Terrier, right now, the big thing is red. They like the red and whites. And, and you have to have a flashy dog for the AKC more than you would with the UKC. Um, I had a solid brindle female that I showed in the UKC, and she would win everything hands down, and she was a very well-conformed female. And then I would take her to the AKC. There was only some selected judges that would use her because they had to be a judge that loved a solid dog with the solid black brindle with no white stockings. She had no white stockings, and so it was harder for her to catch the eye of the AKC judge, even though she was a nice, conformed dog. It seems like AKC prefers a little more of a flashier-type dog as far as colors go. And um, But the blue, some some of the AKC judges would would go ahead and, you know, forgive the color because they know that that does come with the breed and they'll use it. And then some judges would not use. Um, I remember one judge one time and I had a blue dog in the ring and she came up to me and she said, nice dog, but too bad it's a blue. <laughs> so, wow. you know, these AKC judges, they tell it like it is. And especially the older AKC judges that read that, that all around standard and, and they stick to it. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. Yeah. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, in your opinion, or rather, in your experience, um, what was the best way to house a dog? Because I hear a lot of debate, um, kennels versus chains, um, things like that. Okay. And that's a very, very good uh, question. I um, had my dogs, and when I lived in California, I had kennels. Um, I would have t a, a couple in the house, but most of them would be outside. And there is a very good reason um, to, if you, you know, are in decent weather, like we never had snow, and it would get you know, maybe down to 30 degrees at night occasionally. Never anything really below 30 in California. Well, I lived in Central California. And I'm a very, very firm believer that dogs need sunshine and fresh air to be healthy. Mm -hmm. I'm really a firm. And I never kept dogs at length in the house in crates. I always went out and bought pens, kennels, and kept them. Uh, I've used pea gravel, shavings, straw, and I had custom dog houses built. And uh, at for you know at that time I had the custom houses built, and they were very good according to the weather there in California. Um, I've even had dogs outside in the wintertime. I have French Bulldogs right now, and they stay out all day long. And unless it's below 20 degrees, they come in at night, but unless it's below 20 degrees in the daytime, which it doesn't happen too often uh, at all, they're outside all the time. And, you know, and they don't, ha they don't have any lacking pigment around their eyes. They have great coats. 
They're very healthy. And I get puppies outside uh, on visits uh, in the in the yard uh, when they're really young because I start acclimating them. But I want sun and fresh air for my dogs always, as much as I can keep them out. Okay. And uh, what kind of what kind of diet do you prefer? Well, I prefer a premium food. Um, and I usually use if if a if a male or a female adult is a little underweight, and I think they need a little more ump, I feed them a puppy food mm-hmm. because a puppy food has a little more protein and a little more fat in it. And there's nothing in a puppy food that says you can't feed a puppy food to an adult. It just depends on the circumstances. Um, I have had a couple adults that I ramped up their weight in the past, and <laughs> and then I had to take them off the puppy food. <laughs> and then I just put them back on a regular dog. But I usually use it a grain-free. I have jumped around some on my dog food, but most important, I do a lot of cooking. Uh, now that I'm retired, I have a lot more time to train and play with them and cook for them. And everybody gets uh, whole whole wheat brown rice about two to three times a week and I cook them liver and they get some liver once a week and eggs, scrambled eggs and that's basically what I add to their kibble is rice, liver and eggs. Okay. Have you ever um, tried the raw diet at all? Yes, I have. I've used the raw diet um, but it's kind of messy and um, especially like in the summertime, uh, you know, you, you have, we, I live in northern Idaho, of course, where we have bees and things because we have lots of pine trees. So it's really hard even getting out early in the morning if you wanted to feed raw to your dogs. Then you got the bees uh, fighting them for the food. So that's that's not good. So I, I kind of stay away from the raw. Once in a while, if somebody's in the house, they'll... I got a couple of house dogs, and they'll get, you know, something raw, but um, not not very often. I'm, I, you know, it's just kind of something that I supplement to them once in a while, or you know, a little chicken or something. Okay. What are your goals moving forward? Wow, that's a good one. Well. Um, one of one of my goals, of course, is uh, with the French Bulldog. Um, I'm trying to. Um, I've been breeding French Bulldogs off and on for about 15 years, and I'm trying to. And I breed them for just for pets, and I have um, homed them with friends or or and repeat buyers and a lot of people who have have become friends and then have become family uh as far as clients go and i've never really shown the french bulldog in the akc ring and i that's my new goal is i'm kind of switching over i'm i'm um of course, it's, it, it costs a little more money when you want to change your program. And uh, so that's basically where I'm at with that. And I'm using, you know, a, for the first time, a grand champion show dog as a stud. Uh, and I my goal is to get back into the AKC ring, but with a French bulldog. Um, I do have some semen still from one of my old uh, foundation dogs, which is a grandson of uh, of uh, Percy, mm-hmm. Percy Pennypacker. And I am in the process of looking at a, a friend that I co-own one am staff with, and I might get a female, but this is going to be, you know, a year or two down the road. I'm Well, 
I might get a female from her right now, actually. And then just have one Amstaff simply just to breed uh, to my semen that I have stored. And, and once again, that's only AKC. I don't have anything of, from the American Pit Bull Terrier. Okay. Um, you have been judging recently in the American Bully Kennel Club, correct? Uh huh. I have. So, um, what brought that on? What brought that about? Well, um, when I was living in California, once again. Um, I was approached because I had spent so many years in the breed with the American Pit Bull Terrier and the Amstaff, and I, they they just asked me if I wanted to uh, judge the bullies, and I went to my first show to judge in 2005, and back then it was all new and things were different and it, they were not be I'll admit it wasn't structured and um, uh, people didn't know how to handle their dogs and it, it kind of was a disaster I mm -hmm. thought nobody cleaned up after their dogs this is at the Los Angeles in Los Angeles is where I went mm -hmm. and then as time went on uh, I went to a couple other and judged them. One was the Nationals. And it seemed like as time went on, things got better. But, you know, they, everybody has their right to improve and, and learn. And a lot of the bully people, uh, when they first started out, there was just no rhyme or, <laughs> or reason. But now you find that they... People that are uh, showing the dogs are handling much better. They're dressing much better. Um, it has really come a long ways. And at first, you know, people did frown upon it, and especially people in AKC and UKC. But today, uh, I have to give it an A because they have really, really put a lot of effort out, uh, especially um uh, the ABKC and they have rules and regulations and they have uh, put on good shows and now I really enjoy them and I like I said I love to look at dogs mm. and and when I see a great one that's even better <laughs> um, how do you feel about uh, the direction as far as um the majority of the American bully? I think that there are a handful of breeders that are doing very well, and there's some that still need to read more books. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of it depends. Um, like I said, some people are really doing great. And some people, but you know, when I go to the ABKC shows, part of judging is part of helping and mentoring. And when I'm judging at an ABKC show, if someone asks me what's my opinion or how could they improve, uh, I'm always happy to help them. Mm -hmm. Because remember, I'm a, I'm not a competitor anymore. <laughs> so it's so much easier to give up all your secrets. <laughs> right. I gotcha. Um, yeah. Now, do you think the pit bull, the Amstaff, and the bully have the ability to be personal protection dogs? Um. Well, yeah. I, you know, a lot of it depends on two things: genetics and environment. If you take and breed a dog that would be a little more aggressive to another dog that's a little more aggressive, and then you put it into the environment of training it that way, uh, yeah, I, I think they would be a good uh, protection dog. Um, my dogs would never be good protection dogs. They would... Um, 
welcome anybody, whoever you are. <laughs> so I was very critical on good temperaments and not only just toward people, but but to each dog. Mm -hmm. So my dogs never had to have lids on their kennels because they didn't choose to climb up and, and go over on the other side and attack someone or another dog per se. So I think it depends on, on the circumstances of, of how the dog is bred and then how you're going to train it. But you know, they, as a rule, they, they have, the tendency to be a good watchdog, guard dog, um, but mine were not. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. They were show dogs. So some, you know, in order to keep them as a show dog, you just never bring that side out of them. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, my last question, what would you say to somebody wanting to get involved in either the pit bull or the AM staff? What should they know up front and include breeding? Mm -hmm. Well, if, if you're going to start out breeding either the American Pitbull Terrier or the American Staffordshire Terrier, um, you have to read the standard. You need to read the standard. You need to go and look at dogs uh, of that breed that you're interested in and sit ringside and take mental notes. Um, talk to breeders that will give you an honest opinion. And um, you're just going to kind of have to live it and breathe it and, and want to do it. And then there's always that certain element of luck. If you do start breeding dogs, you can get a little lucky but you really need to study you have to take it seriously and you can't be in it for the short haul if you want to do well with breeding dogs and have champions and show and and you've you've got to be in it for a long time and and be very passionate about it um I, I spent a lot of hours lots of hours with my mentor and um, going to the show rings, talking to other people, studying dogs, um, looking at dogs, then look at your standard, but never give up the standard. Mm -hmm. The standard first and foremost. Yeah, the standard, and then, and it doesn't hurt to have a good eye for a dog. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The, it's, you know, it's kind of like a little God-given talent. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I gotcha. So, so that was um, all the questions I had. Was there anything you wanted to add? I just wanted to remind everybody that, um, you know, what what I have said is is a lot of it I have studied and I know a lot of it to be true, uh, the results that I get from my breeding programs, because I have done it for so many years, and that you're not going to go out there and do it overnight. You, you know, you're going to have to be in it for the long haul. You're going to have to be passionate about what you want to do as far as breeding dogs and breeding good dogs. That's the most important thing is to start out with the best and then do your best. And that's why when I started, I went to the best people I could find out there breeding dogs. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, Pam, I, uh, I thank you so much for getting on and I'm sure my listeners will be stoked to, uh, to see the announcement. <laughs> um, well, I hope so too, for your, for your sake and that, uh, and then you can, um, uh, get, get back to me when you've got the, uh, edited clip and, and we'll take it from there. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Pam. Okay. You're welcome and have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye.